So, thank you all for being here. My name is Ellen G. Pui, and um, I am the, um, the new president of the club, unfortunately, because we lost our very near and dear president in April. Uh, and we have uh, in the newsletter, we had information about Gary's celebration of life. And, uh, Sheila is here, and his wife. Um, they were married in 1980. And, she, she's going to be conducting that celebration of life, and we're invited to be a bit of a So, let's start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody will stand. <laughs> the tradition in rock clubs. I've been to three rock clubs in the last week, and all of us do this by Hillary I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you all for coming. This is great. Do we have any uh, visitors or past members who haven't been here in a while? We'd like to say hello. Yeah, Debbie, and she just rejoined, so we're glad about that. Right, uh -huh. Debbie, the chief of the Mermaid College uh, Cottage. Anybody else would like to be recognized or is new? Well, we're, we're all glad you came. Uh, I've been visiting with other clubs, and lots of folks are just kind of recovering like we are from COVID. And uh, I'm glad that we still have our loyal group of supporters, and hopefully we can, we can get back to where we were before, but we just continue to. Uh, to do the things we do so well. And Elaine, our program chair, really gets lots of credit for having us in meetings and for having the great speakers that you've had. Uh, I'd like to thank the volunteers who did the silent auction, Marjorie and Liz. Uh, Y'all just did a fantastic job. We had a lot of help from Terry and Laura. Thank you very much for doing the Wonderful job. It was really a beautiful show. We're sorry we didn't have the attendance that we hoped for, but we're working on things like that. <laughs> yeah, we are. Uh, the celebration of life for theory will be here in this room uh, on July 21st from 6 to 8. It is in your newsletter that you've received, hopefully, in the mail. It, uh, the email. If you haven't received it, it may mean your, your dues need to be renewed or you need to get on our mailing list. So stop by the, the desk there from under the front and uh, let us get you signed up so that you receive information about what the club is doing. Uh, July the 21st, 6 to 8, here in that multi purpose room. And if you're wondering about what all the, <laughs> the decorations are for, it is hard to believe. I was looking at uh, some history about the club, and we were founded in 1962. So this is our 60th anniversary year. The diamond jubilee. Trying to have some fun things going on throughout the year. Uh, looking at maybe a, a birthday party and some things like that to just celebrate the fact that you know a lot of different people have come together and kept this club, club going for 60 years. And I think that's really outstanding. Oh, hi, David. Hi. One of our new members. Mm -hmm. yeah. hi. Hi. Yeah. He, he was at the Searchers Club last night. <laughs> uh, this next Wednesday, we're going to have a little field trip or a meetup, if you will, at the San Diego County Fair down at the Del Mar Fairgrounds. And if you haven't been to a gym and mineral exhibit at a county fair, they're pretty fantastic. And Jennifer's uh, Sam is going to uh, do a docent tour for us at 11.45. So if you'd like to come to the fair, we're going to be passing out two things on this little board. One is information about the fair. And again, it's in the newsletter, the email newsletter. This is the details on the fair. You need to get your tickets, parking and tickets ahead of time. But if you're planning to come, you think you might come, let us know. And that way we can look for you. But it should be really fun. There's going to be lots of entertainment, of course, if you have been to the county fairs, and they're going to have a lot of uh, activities, and it will be good for us to see things that they're doing to help them be more people along into the gym and mental world. Uh, grandkids are, uh, for those of you who have them, <laughs> would probably enjoy going to the fair. The gym and mental booth is evidently, exhibit hall is evidently right next to the rides. So uh, it will be centrally located for lots of fun. 
uh, in July, we're having our annual, I think this is our second annual, <laughs> uh, show and share, and we're calling it a show, share, and sell. So what we'd like is for people to say they're going to come and bring some portions of their collection or their jewelry that they make or the stones that they collect or just a story about why you're involved in the club. Maybe talk for about 10 minutes. And then if you have any items that you'd like to sell after everybody does their little presentation, we'll have those items available for sale. And I think that'll be a lot of fun. We'll get to see uh, what our... Okay. Oh, you got another sign? Yeah, I got another one. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to pass this around, look at a couple of pages. Um, and then also, back in the back, at the site of auction, we collected um, some memories to give to Sheila that you may have about Gary. And if you weren't here at the site of auction and would like to fill out something that we can give to Sheila about your memories or thoughts about Gary, this is also a little bit So this is going to be kind of chock full of information for you. Uh, after our presentation from Robert Lou, we're going to have uh, our raffle tickets. We've got some neat items over here, including a beautiful book that Robert has donated. And uh, we also have some items in the back from our club's collection from the silent auctions. So if there are things you'd like to buy after the meeting, uh, that those will be on sale here. Discounted kind of rates, good prices. Yeah, yeah good prices. Good prices. <laughs> So I'm going to start passing this around, and Elaine, our fabulous program director, is now going to introduce our program for this evening. And we do have it being Zoom, so we're delighted that some people have signed up on Zoom. They'll walk in front of the cameras. <laughs> and it's going to be a great meeting. Thank you, Elaine. You're on. Thank you, Robert. Hey. I always want to introduce a Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. You know, a photographer, a jeweler, um, he's he's used alternate, I'm, I'm reading this because it's like so much, black bamboo polyester fibers. He wrote the book on personal adornment, the art of photography. He also wrote a book on beats, you know, fabulous book on beats, which I happened to review when I was a GIA for Dems and Gemology. And he didn't even know that. I had to send him a copy of that. I got a free book that way. Um, <laughs> but his story of beads is legendary. His knowledge of uh, different fields, I mean, the things that he has done. Besides jewelry, he's, he's judged competitions. He's self trained as a model builder, you know, and he, he wrote a book on, I believe, it was World War II. Uh, model, model, ship models. Of ship World models. War II. And just uh, because of. He, yeah, how, how did you do that? But what he does is he honors craftspeople in his publication. He honors craftspeople. He he celebrates their lives in the pages of his book. I mean, his his, his publication ornament. You know, he lets people know about the silk weavers and the dyers and the knitters and and the fabric artists and the jewelers and and all sorts of different media. He honors the art in his publication. And uh, it is my great pleasure to know Robert Liu, who I've known for many years. And uh, I just figured it I was sorry to miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to tell you that the, the last time I spoke to you, I was on deathbed's board. My heart rate had dropped to 25. I didn't know that. If it weren't for Patrick, I would not be here. I had a complete blockage between my oracles and the ventricles, and I didn't know why I was so tired. And somehow I called my doctor. She said, get in the ambulance. And they took me to the hospital, put in a pacemaker. But as they did so, they made my lung. So for the next seven days, I was in scripts with a pump hooked up to me, dragging it to the bathroom. <laughs> and the worst time in the world. But at least uh, that has uh, brought me back to life. So uh, I apologize for my presentation. I don't even remember. 
thought I did, but I knew I could barely get through it. Normally, I'm a fairly energetic 84 year old. Although, you know, <laughs> when you're 84, you know your train is going to pull out of the station sometime. And uh, I, I wanted to tell you that all that praise that Elaine gave me is really due to my late wife, who passed in 2020, and my son Patrick, who is the backbone of Ornament Magazine. He is the one that is responsible for everything. We've been at this for 46 years. And uh, 48. 48. <laughs> 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 didn't quite do it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we cover jewelry and clothing from around the world and from antiquity to present day. Uh, and it's been a, a largely a family event now there's just the two of us and uh it's, it's been both a struggle and a joy so uh at the end of this I'll, I'll sort of tell you what i was and what i have been doing and what i do but uh when Elaine nicely took us out to dinner she mentioned that uh, her father was a italian prisoner of war captured in north africa well, I was born in Rome, Italy, right on the verge of the Sino-Japanese War. So I, I lived in occupied Japanese occupied China during the war most of the time. So I'm very much a child of World War II, and that's why one of my big interests is in World War II, and I've written about many, many aspects of it. So I, uh, you'll see that I got a a very checkered career, but for the past 48 years, I've been mainly a editor for Oilers Magazine. So, what I'm going to tell you about tonight is that the prehistoric American Southwest. We're just on the verge of the greater Southwest. And as you can see, the Four Corners area is a wonderful area because it's one of the places where there are more prehistoric ruins than anywhere else in the United States. And some of you may have traveled there. It's all within a pretty easy drive. I usually go to uh, Arizona and then I may cross it to New Mexico. And the most wonderful place is near the thing in Colorado. So we are very, very lucky to be in this area. And the other place I will talk about is Casas Grandes, which is in Chihuahua, 263 miles of Tucson. And this has very important because it very much influenced how things are the previous or southwest. This is a, a veneer wall of Pueblo Benito in Chaco County. And this beautiful type of game in modern uh, Western architecture is actually an import from Mesoamerica. Sorry. That's all right. I'm trying to get a better view. Okay. And there's something blocking in the time. Are you okay now? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Now, why do we study these little trinkets? We study ancient ornaments to understand our past and ourselves. And this is a boring state Chinese horn I beat. It's an incredible precision piece of glass that has never been done since that time in the Zhou Dynasty, around 300 BC. We study ethnographic ornaments to understand other cultures. And this is a Jing Dynasty, Chinese rattan and silver bracelets of the type that my grandmother used to wear. And then we study contemporary ornaments to understand crafting techniques 
that will soon be our history. And this is Bill Wood, an American jeweler who made this silver brooch. Now, the prehistoric Southwest is represented in various different ways. This is an older map. Here you see the four corners, and these are the various cultures that are represented here. This is a more modern map. Things people have been renamed. So what we're going to do is study this area, the ruins and the peoples and their jewelry. And as you can maybe see, all these places are closely tied to rivers because as you know, we're in the Southwest. We're in the middle of a terrible drought. Well, these people depended on water for their living. And many of these places were abandoned because of droughts. People permanently left. Um, due to sensitivity, many things that used to be shown no longer can be shown because if they were associated with graves, Native Americans felt this was dishonorable and would not let it be on display anymore. For instance, all of this jewelry that used to be from Casa Grande in Arizona, you no longer can see. And there are also rooms in the Southwest that are so sensitive that the archaeologists don't even want you to talk about it because they don't want anybody to start thinking we're not going to, you know, even be able to ever study this material. So, you know, we have to be aware of sensitivities to cultures. Of course, me being Chinese, every museum in the world has our grave goods. If we were to protest, their museums would be empty. But you know, Chinese don't quite think of that way. We feel that this is an expression of people knowing our culture. And, uh, you know, even though there's a really strong feelings about death and dealing with the death, dead in China, I feel that whatever has been excavated is good for people to understand because you can't understand modern cultures without understanding ancient cultures. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble. Oh, so we're looking at the prehistoric sites of the American Southwest and their jewelry. And this is Cliff Palace in Mesa Verde. And these dates indicate when they were occupied from 550, about 1300 CE. Has anybody ever been to Mesa Verde? Ah, you have. Oh, you have. Okay. One, one of my favorite places, just an incredibly grand. This is a sandstone cave that caved in so that you have this grand space here and people built their housing there for various reasons mostly for protection. And except for the fact that there's sort of nothing organic left, everything else is intact because of, of the arid weather. And that is one of the reasons why we have many of the artifacts because we're so dry. Where else do we have terrific artifacts because of the dry weather? Can anybody answer? Right, right. Peru. I mean, Peru, but if you're in a rainforest, you're not going to have any of these things. And one of the good things about climate change is now all the ice fields are melting and all the things that have been frozen in ice fields are coming out. And we're beginning to see what prehistoric North Americans lived like and what their artifacts were. So there's good and bad and everything. Now these are really special. I've, these are mosaic overlay frog and bird paintings. Maybe the biggest are this big. This is on spondylus. The others on different shelves, bitter clam. And this is for those of you who are 
gemologist, you can see it's overlay of all these little tessels in various degrees of crudeness. And there's only about 55 of these known. And I've looked at most of them. There are none at May Severity. And uh, the last time I went to the federal repository in Tucson, which is the size of a football field, well, you no longer can even go there because they don't have funds to have somebody take you around. Whoops, uh, they just cut my funding again. <laughs> Yes, you never know. You talk about the feds and they'll get it. <laughs> I, I don't think I could. I, yeah, right. Oh, you're not gonna. You know, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say next and let you do that. Oh, so I don't. So I think it's the laptop on the sleeve. The laptop is up. Yeah, he grabbed his hand and then it changed. When you when you moved your hand, it changed. Source, searching. Yeah, it's a signal. No signal. Okay, well, should I talk about myself? Yeah. Okay. I I have um, I have a very very strange career. When I went to, uh, I, I, as you know, I was born in Italy. I lived in China during the Japanese occupation, although we finally escaped to the free part of China, a three month uh, odyssey with my mother and five kids, me being five years old at that time. Mm -hmm. After the war, the communists came, and we came here in 1946 to go to school and none of us ever went back. So I came to America with about three words of English, but um, I managed to learn it in about three months and uh, they took me out of uh, essentially kindergarten and put me in a decent grade. At eight years old, I wasn't feeling very good at being as low grade as I was. And in that time, I've managed to go through high school, college, and I went to graduate school. And I was an ichthyologist, which means someone that studies fish. But my specialty was studying the behavior of fish. And I worked with a group of fish called puffish that some of you might know. These are endangered fish that occur in the deserts. They occur from Bishop California to the coast of Venezuela. So if you want to have a very useful profession, you become a professional ethologist or behaviorist studying fish. That <laughs> earns you a lot of money. <laughs> well, of course, the, the first job offer I got was at Lubbock. And at that time, when I went to uh, that part of Texas, I felt this is going to be very tough for a Chinese with a, uh, an American wife and half Chinese kids. So I did not go through with that. And I stayed at UCLA and worked in the School of Medicine as a gerontologist. That is, I studied aging. I was a research gerontologist. And we worked with different types of animals to see how we could affect their lifespans. And so we did things like uh, keeping them at different temperatures, giving them different amounts of food. Wow, I must have done something terrible. It's okay, I'm going to do the old turn it off and turn it back on. Right, <laughs> yes, is it plugged in? Um, so uh, while I was at UCLA, my major professor, uh, and I got interested in beads because that's when the first wave of beads started to be imported from Africa. Nobody knew anything about them. So he said, here's $1,500. Why don't you start a magazine about it? <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, being trained in college and grad school, you have no practical knowledge. 
You don't realize starting a magazine requires millions of dollars. So $1,500 spare to get your typewriter. So my wife and I essentially learned from the Gutenberg level of printing to modern printing. We went through everything. And we started this magazine called the Bee Journal, which soon morphed into Elliot because we wanted to cover all kinds of things that people want. So I am a scientist that segued into art. And uh, despite the fact that it's maybe strange to people, it's not a bad combination. The scientists have a rigorous way of looking at things and doing things, which I think is good if you want to really present things honestly. Okay. Okay. Is this what we work? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, can that thing be? Uh, so anyway, these pendants have only about 55 known. So these are exceedingly rare. And uh, next, please. Oops, is that the next? That's the next page, yeah. Oh, that's the next page? Yeah. <laughs> we skipped one, but that's okay. All right. Most of you probably don't know what life was like about a, you know, from 500 to 1300. Well, many of these drawings are cliff drawings. And they were in the face of cliffs. This is balcony house. It's 600 feet above the canyon floor. And about 40 families lived there. This is a little seat, which is the size of a wash tub. It was their source of water. And if you know American tourists, all of us are carrying around bottles of water, drinking away, some of it's icy cold. Well, that bottle of water was probably more than one day's supply for every person. And if you're 600 feet above, how do you get there? Well, you climb using these pet hand holes and foot holes from the canyon floor. Imagine if you are 30, 40 years old, carrying a load of wood or food or water, what this was like. This was no easy commute. Most of us would not have been able to do it. Thankfully, the uh, National Park Service made footsteps for tourist walk because none of us would have been able to climb up here. Now, why did they live here? Probably for defensive purposes. They were warring on each other. And here is a typical defensive doorway. You can't walk upright. You have to crawl through. That means if you were an enemy, you crawl through, someone could easily bonk you on the head and knock you out. So everything had a purpose. And you see, this is two giant rocks with stoneware to block it off and only one opening. So you can imagine life was not easy. Above this was their farm fields and they grew farm, corn, beans, things like that using only water from rainfall. So they were very good at trapping water and irrigation, things like that to manage a very, very scarce field. Next please. Now, most people don't realize from antiquity on, people traded. 
They wanted things that others had from distances. So that was also the case in the prehistoric Southwest. What did they trade? Pottery, macaw or parrot feathers, greenstone jewelry, which they lacked, fibers, obsidian. And you know how important obsidian is because you make lives with it. And you make incredible jewelry, although the people in the Southwest did not have the skills to do that. These are America, they do. Cells, that is axes, because not everybody had the suitable stones to make axes. Spondylus shells. I don't know what these are, but it's some kind of uh, seeds or fruit. What was? Acorns. Oh, maybe acorns. Maybe. This is Aztec copper money. And here is salt. And salt is, as you know, terrifically important for life. So if we look at the prehistoric Southwest, they have an amazing network of trails for trading. All these places that had shells, they traded it all the way over, we're almost maybe into Texas here. So things that were traded were buffalo hide, bird feathers, and turquoise uh, among things. Here you can see copper bells, shell, turquoise. These were all precious items that people wanted. So life was very, very active in antiquity. Next one. And if we look at an area in Arizona, we see here shells are coming up from the Gulf, from the Pacific. Turquoise is coming from California, Nevada. Pottery from elsewhere, salt and the all important uh, parrots. And why were they important? Because the feathers are so important in ritual life for the ancients. And for those of you that are interested in gemology, well, arginine, this kind of red sort of sandstone, which occurs in Prescott, Arizona, was used for their jewelry. And here again, I show that map of pre-contact trade routes. Next please. Now, if we zoom in on Arizona and the whole come and the whole come, you can see the terrific amount of, of trade that was in and out of one spot, obsidian, other stones, salt, corn. There's a foodstuff, brown stone, copper, and shelf. So everywhere you look, people were trading things, making what was local and trading it for far off things that they did not have. For instance, how Argonite comes in chunks like this. Well, what did they do? They made it into bead blanks. And how do they do this? They cut it into sheets, they scored it, broke it off into squares, pierced it, and then put it on a string and rub it back and forth on sandstone, turn them into disc beads. Can you imagine what this entails, the amount of labor? Here, this, is, this little cache probably belonged to a jewel. Different types of argillite, Jewelry. This is a, a, a nasal plug. These are bead blanks. These are broken parts of things. This is some kind of hard stone. This is a crinoid, which is a fossil sea life that has a hole. So they use it as beads. Olivella shell and various pieces of work turquoise. So this was somebody's precious little cat. I was dug up and I was fortunate that uh, a museum gave it to me because I was studying this. Wow. Next, please. So 
if you go to the Southwest, say if you go to Tuzi Group in the uh, Verde Valley, that is wonderful this place that date from the 1930s when the conservation, the CCC Corps was active. Any of you old enough to know what that was? Where they put people to work during the Great Depression and make trails, make buildings. Well, CCC did a lot of museum work. And so they're showing you the kind of drills, micro myths, finished tabs, argillite tabs, how to work this, different things made from that. And in this little dish, these are micro beads. These are so small that they compare with the smallest micro beads from Afghanistan, which was a much more advanced culture. So these people had great skills. They did not have much in the way of technology and everything, every piece of jewelry made in the Southwest was done without a metal tool. It was all stone tools or organic materials. So imagine you're drilling without anything but stone tools. But they, did, they had copper bell, right? They had copper, but not at work. They had copper bells and other trinkets that came from Mesoamerica. Um, and this, this is not only in the Southwest. If you go to Peru, much of their incredible metal work, gold work, where they would beat gold to this big a mask, it was all done with stones. They did not use metal tools. And I'll show you where I did some experiments uh, and failed miserably um, because I didn't have the strength or the skills of the ancient peoples. The ancient peoples were so incredibly skilled with what they had that they make us, you know, here you've got a rolling mill, you got a hammer, you got an anvil. Well, you know, hell, they didn't have any of that. Okay, next please. So I know all of you are interested in turquoise. Here are turquoise mines in Nevada, Arizona, Utah, elsewhere in the Four Corners area. They go all the way down to Sonora. And turquoise was so important in the Southwest. How did they mine it? They used stone walls. That is, they took axe-shaped stones, they hafted it, onto wood and they use this as hammer as well as using fire. Because as you know, turquoise will occur in very, very thin sheets. So if you heat the wood and then you throw water on it, it cracks it and therefore it's friable and you can get it out. But this is how, these are prehistoric tools and they did the same things in Chilean prehistoric copper mines using the same kind of tools. So technology was crude, but widespread in you know, our pre-Columbian world. Next please. Here we have locations of prehistoric turquoise mines extending down into Sonora. And here we have pre-Columbian Mesoamerica settlements. Well, here is the Surreal's mine somewhere in New Mexico that was visited by a bunch of uh, geologists in 2012 to show you the kind of environment. Here they were lucky. They weren't tunneling underground. They were above ground and undoubtedly they used the fire technique to get at this. Next thing. Okay. So if Turquoise was the cryptocurrency of pre Columbian land. <laughs> it was so valuable. 
here we have different lines and the roots of the exports to Mesoamerica through time. These arrows go through different from early to late. And you can see how popular turquoise was. When in about 300 AD, there was very little use. But as we progress up to 1500, look at how wide usage became in Southwest US, North Mexico, West Mexico, Central, Oaxaca, Guerrero, and among the Mayans. So over a million pieces of turquoise have been found. Just imagine. But today, some archaeologists feel that Mexico had its own mines and it was all, not all from the Southwest. Yet, there's really no substantial mines that have been found for, for turquoise yet. So, this is something that's ongoing, and archaeologists are always testing things. It may be true, it may not be, it may be partially true. Next, please. This is Casas Grande, and that's about 200 miles south of the border, which I visited in 1972 when I was an ichthyologist. We were collecting fish, and uh, we stopped by here to pick. That, that little clip is my professor's 12 year old brat that we had to take a look <laughs> Should have left her there. Uh, but this was a very important place, occupied for this length of time. And why was this important? This place supplied ideas northward to the prehistoric Southwest. For instance, here is a Mesoamerican overlay mosaic painting. You can see they're reusing pads, drill pads, tessera, they're using other materials. And they taught us how to bevel the edges of the tessera so that you can have things lying flat on the curved surface. You think this is nothing, but this is really a big, big technological advance. Here is a Southwest uh, pendant, overlay pendant, and you can see a great deal of similarity. So uh, the next thing. So here are examples of prehistoric overlay pendants from the Southwest. I want to show you the clever way they had. They glued these shell disc beads to it so that you could string it up and wear it as a pendant. And this is a detail of how they did it. But what is interesting is that every one of these had a patch of argillite in the middle. This is, these all represent ballast rocks. You see the way they orient these tessera to suggest legs. And this is chips that are falling off, both tessera and pieces of adhesive, which was probably pine pitch. That's what they used to glue it up. Well, What's the significance of the red? It could be that this is to imitate a Chihuahuan frog that has a red spot on the back, which produces very hallucinogenic secretions at the back of its back. Uh, back. And now people are using this as treatments. Uh, I, I forgot the term, that it's licking the frog or something like that. Ew. But it's so powerful that they use it to treat PTSD among veterans. And it's supposed to be a, a really life changing experience to have this hallucinogen. And many in the Southwest and the Mayans are very big on hallucinogens. They've been administered in many different ways. 
some orally, some anally, but you know, magic was quite, as you know, peyote is a big southwest uh, hallucinogen. So this is maybe stylized frogs that were hallucinogenic and that would have probably given them added power. Next please. This is showing you that mosaic overlay was done on shell. We did it on stone. Turkish shell. Turkish, yes. And they did it on wood. Uh, so, uh, and here's some adhesive chips. This is remnant of adhesive. Well, you don't realize this. These are so small that I decided, okay, I'm going to take about one millimeter thick plastic. I'm going to cut it into pieces. And I'm going to see how small can the pieces be and I can still hold them in my hand and grind them on sandpaper. Well, I could not get anywhere near as small as theirs. And, you, and I don't have big fingers. So you can see the skill level that, of these ancient peoples. Um, you, you think it's easy, but making hundreds of these, you know, if you, Cut stone, can you, you know, you'd go crazy. I mean, it's just amazing. But of course, these people had a lot of time. They weren't punching in nine to five. They weren't on the computer all day. So time was on their side. But you have to realize everything that was done was done without metal and was almost always abraded. Next thing. So the mosaic overlay technique, if you go to say the Herb Indian Fair, you'll see them working this. How do they do it today? They cut this on a diamond wheel, different kinds of shell and stone. Then they epoxy it on the shell like this, and then they grind it down. So it looks kind of like that but you're wasting terrific amount. Look at this. This is probably two, maybe three millimeters thick. These were probably one millimeter or less. So they did not waste things. And look at, look at how well this is done. This is prehistoric. This is a, a present day. Um, today we use epoxy, they use pine pitch. <laughs> Next question. Now, several genera of shells were important in prehistoric Americas, as well as in Europe. Amazingly, Spondylus and Glyceramus of the British Bitterroot clan were the two genera of shells that were used in the Americas at a much later date, of course, as you know, from about 500 to 1300. But in Europe, it was 8,000 years ago that they used this. And where did they get theirs? Well, they went to, to the Black Sea to get farmers, and they brought it all the way up the Rhine Valley into the Balkans and Germany. And they did the same thing. They used them for jewel. So it's an incredible coincidence that these two shells were so attractive to ancient peoples. And here you see the raw shell and pieces that were made into jewelry. And this is an example of true inlay done in Peru where their culture was much more sophisticated than in the Southwest. This is a Nazca piece. And here, this is one of the most amazing things from Western Mexico. It's actually a vest made of fondamus pads with mother of pearl, alabella shells, and a necklace. So you can see this, this was a shell that had terrific value. So as long as 8,000 years ago, Europeans were using it, 5,000 
years ago in Valdivia, Ecuador, and much later in the Southwest. Um, there are other shells like Khan that were important in prehistoric America, but we did not have that in the Southwest. Next to Here I'm contrasting Spondylus use Sipan, which is down in Peru, an Andean culture versus Mesoamerica. This is a, um, an exploded view of a warrior king, Sparrow, well, from the top down. All this is Spandas. You see? These are thousands and thousands of beads that made up these ornaments. And then whole shells were placed by his foot. Then more underneath the wooden mat that he was laid on. So you can tell that Spondylus was terrifically important. And interestingly enough, as some of you might know, Peru is about a terrifically long seacoast. North, southern Peru is terrifically cold and Spondylus can't grow them. It's only in northern Peru that it could grow, but it wasn't enough to meet their needs. So they had to go up to Ecuador, which is all warm water, to get more. And that means that they had to raft on balsa rafts, maybe 3,800 kilometers, sailing by currents alone to go up to West Mexico and Ecuador to get what they wanted in terms of the shells. Here we have uh, Tio Tio Khan. This is a, the exploded view of an elaborate necklace. And you can see they're using spotless also. And they're using these stylized teeth. And I don't know the significance of why, but uh, as you know, the Mayans and the Aztecs were very much into human sacrifice. So it might have had some significance. Next thing. Okay, not everything was fancy. Bracelets made from bitter uh, sweet prayers, turquoise tabs, other tabs from non precious stones. They took the shell and made many different shapes. These, are, as you can see, this is quite small. This is a, uh, only a 10 centimeter scale, but they were all jewelry. And these bracelets were virtually the mark of a Hohokam person. Every Hohokam wore these. And they, here, this is a remarkable Asinagua shell pendant. You compare it in scale. I mean, this thing is tiny, tiny. Look at how forcefully done this was. This is a stylized beard. They cut it out a few scribe lines, and it's a very animated animal with a turquoise speed eye. So the, these people were remarkable artists with a terrific uh, aesthetic sense. Next thing. A lot of these were frog or toad pen. As you can see, this is a dorsal side, the ventral side, made from a shell and all different kinds. Some with, with overlay, some with only one, some had anatomical features, some were fat, some were thin. And here's a bracelet with a frog head and here's another frog head. And since I have a biological background, it suggests to me that these were probably frogs or toads after the summer when they estivated, that was, they buried themselves in the mud and essentially became dehydrated. When the rains came, they came out rehydrated. And here are rehydrated ones. So these are different frog and toad pendants. Next. 
What? What is the significance of the garden? You'll see. <laughs> Everywhere where water is vital to life, frogs were important. This frog is from salmon wounds in New Mexico, uh, somewhere near Chaco. These are Tyrone gold frogs from Colombia. These are Egyptian fans frogs. These are from Mesoamerica. So frogs have a terrific association with water. And without water, you have no life. So you find this kind of frog energy, frog effigy everywhere where water was important. And you know, this time span, this is dynastic Egypt. This could be 16th, 18th dynasty, 1800 BC. This could be 500 or 1100 AD. So throughout a huge span of time, humans were terrifically interested in making images of frogs. Well, I wanted to try to carve some of those. Um, so I took a, a test shell from the Northwest because I didn't want to waste one of these precious ones. I, I uh, took a tile cutter and cut sandstone, limestone, slate, siltstone, and a diamond uh, file. And an archaeologist friend of mine made some uh, micro trails for me. Well, these show you, I took, I did 15 minutes for each. Here's diamond, here's uh, the sil uh, siltstone, the slate, the limestone, and the sandstone. So sandstone cuts almost as well as diamonds. But that's as far as I got. <laughs> I, I never got to do one of these replica frogs, which I might do someday. But, you know, you can't just speak about things as a scientist. If you want real hard facts, you got to do the experiment. Um, next week. Well, there's continuity. Here are H's formulas and uh, glitter root bracelets. This is what the Pima nowadays make. The same kind of thing. But because of overfishing, these only fit children. You can't find the shell big enough for adults. So they can't really continue their cultural tradition. Here is a a wonderful um, etched and painted shell. And how did they etch the shell? They took the fruit of the saguaro cactus. Do you know what the saguaro cactus is? Looks like a giant person and they have red fruit. Well, when you ferment that, that becomes almost like vinegar. What you do is you cover the shell with pitch or bitumen, that is tar, you scratch out the parts that you want etched and you immerse it in this weak acid solution. And lo and behold, this is what a modern day Pima did. So all of these techniques, they still want to do today. Next please. Okay. Here are some intact pieces of jewelry. This is intact Southwest bracelet and a necklace with tabs of turquoise and abalone. And as you know, abalone only comes from the Pacific coast uh, of California. So they had to travel a long ways to get this. But you can see it's terrifically crude. I'm not quite sure what kind of fibers they use. But if we go down to the Peruvian North Coast, 
look at the sophistication of these intact bracelets and necklaces cut out of mother of pearl. So, you know, the Southwest is not that advanced. These people cut out these intricate shapes. And also, if you're a necklace maker, you would never think of putting things together this way. I would never think of joining them by their ends to make a bracing. So they were terrifically imaginative in the ancient world. Um, these are things that you can't even know until you look at it and you begin to wonder, what? Why did you do it this way? Well, they did, and you know, the results are beautiful. So I just wanted to show you so these both came from very arid places, so they're intact. Next. What would be the age of those? Uh, the, the, the Southwest is somewhere, you know, maybe 11, 1200. Uh, the Peruvian may, may be quite a bit older. I've forgotten what that culture was, the warring culture, but the, most of those cultures were far older cultures than our Southwest. Okay, here I'm going to run through some Southwest sites and their jewelry. This is Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon with some of the most beautiful rooms. Here, the cliff collapsed in 1941 and crushed a lot of buildings. They found these shell and stone beads and turquoise semi-finished pieces. Here again is that veneer wall. And this is a jet frog inlaid with turquoise fell over the what kind of stone is the frog? Jet. jet. You know, jet, sort of coal like material. Yeah. yeah. Um, next thing. And here is this majestic view of Mesa Verde. Uh, I forgot how many, maybe 70 families lived here. And all of these round depressions are kivas. And that's where they worshiped. These were once roofed over by wooden beams um, and they're circular. So this whole thing must have collapsed sometime way, way back, leaving this cavity and the people took the debris, cut them into shape and made their homes. Um, it's just one of the most amazing places in the Southwest, in America, I think. And here's an intact piece of jewelry they found there of cord and olivetta shells. And, you know, if you're a modern uh, necklace maker, you might even think of doing that, and it's probably quite attractive. Okay, next please. Here's another view. And, uh, oh, it had about 150 rooms each housing a family. So this was a, a pretty big habitation site. And here are other kinds of jewelry they found out of shell. Here's Kona's shell. Here are other shell pieces that they made. And then there's a whole bunch of different things, including argillite and other stones, a few turquoise, but mainly shell. And you know, if you're in Colorado, you're not gonna get Green shells. Where did they come from? Hundreds and hundreds of miles away through trade. And Mesa Verde is very, very distinctive. This is a Mesa Verde mug that my late sister collected that I just brought home from her house. And uh, anyone looking at this will instantly know. So they were skilled in many different arts. Next week. Here again is Balcony House. And how did people walk in that very rocky, thorny ground? Well, they made sandals like this. And at least gave their foot some protection. Here is a reconstructed view of someone that may have lived in the prehistoric Southwest. They had turkey 
tether leggings, they used rabbit furs. They also had dyed cotton. Um, so they were, you know, able to clothe themselves, protect themselves with weapons, protect their feet, and they survived in this very harsh environment. Next please. Not all Pueblos were big. If you go to Canyon de Shea, you see from the rim, this tiny little one made with 20 inhabitants. And this little slight depression, and here's water. So everywhere where they lived, they tried to be near water because water was water. Here, this is this incredible structure in Casa Grande in Arizona. This is a protective roof because this is Adobe and it was a part of a very large settlement near the Salt River. This was probably an observatory of some kind. And this is a Hohokam dwelling. And here are some Hohokam uh, bracelets, uh, necklaces and pendants, and the tools they used, mainly pieces of sandstone that we use like we, they use like we would use sandpaper. And a little tiny micro drill. Although people say that the thorns of cactus were used, we add some sand and twirl it with water. Um, I've tried drilling with diamond drills and drilling ain't easy. <laughs> and it's not easy. You don't even know how these people did this, the patience they had. So this was only occupied for a little over a thousand years. Next please. This is a, another wonderful place, Salmon Ruins, in uh, near Chaco in New Mexico. This is a reconstructed Olivella shell. And this is a tab of sand, uh, some kind of stone. It's very attractive. And the famous Pecos, New Mexico site yielded these kind of drilled, drilled shells. And they did not throw anything away. Pieces of ceramic shard were drilled and made into pendants. Next thing. This site is Tuzi Gut in the Verde Valley of Arizona. It's a hilltop place with only 200 inhabitants, but they found seven mosaic shell pendants. Now that doesn't make sense. If only 55 total <laughs> here, these people had seven. So undoubtedly they were manufacturing them. And these people, made terrific little whimsical shell uh, jewelry. They made tabs of argillite. They made bone hair pieces. And just like everywhere else in the Southwest, they utilized what was local, yucca, and they made sandals out. Next please. Um, the, the nice thing is, Tuzi Good and Marmus Roman Castle, all these places are within a very easy drive. So you ever go there, maybe in the spring or the fall, you can see it. And here on this cliff is Marzuma Castle. There's a creek down here, so they had easy access to water. This only had about uh, four, 300 years of habitation. And this is a model of what that castle looked like. These were essentially like a modern apartment building, only you climbed up through ladders, placed in holes, or outside. And this was found as a mosaic overlay on wood, as well as this beautiful pattern piece of cotton cloth. Next one. This, when we go to Northern Arizona, by Flagstaff, this grand place called Upaki. Here's an excavator room. This is what 
I reconstructed who he looks like with parrots and uh, various plants, including ginseng weed. As you know, ginseng weed is a very powerful host of lemon. That local weed, the cattle eat it, they go crazy. If humans inhale it, they go crazy in a different way. Um, and what's interesting is that this area has a lot of volcanic activity, volcanic cones. And what's significant about that is once the volcanic soil starts to degrade, it's terrific because it holds moisture. So you can grow a lot better in this kind of soil than the regular uh, Southwest soil. So these people, you know, took advantage of everything that happened in their environment. It was admirable about how they tried to adapt. Next please. Here is a Sanabo man wearing his jewelry, earrings of shell or stone. He has a labret. That means this is something that pierces your lower chin. Uh, he's wearing two necklaces of olivella, some other kind of shell, and this is a frog pen. But he's not wearing a nose plug, which were found in the bandits at the uh, um, parking. And what you do is you pierce the septum between the two nostrils and you plug this in. And here's a stone mosaic overlay from that area. Next thing. So now we've come to the end of the Southwest. I just want to show you that there are many, many ancient cultures in America. This is a banner stone from Eastern US. And this could go back 3000 to 1000 BC. And it was both a tool and an ornament. People used to think this was a balanced stone that you use when you sh threw an antler, antler. Does anybody know what that is? Oh, yeah. Such a most yes, yes, yes. So uh, they thought it gave you extra, you know, momentum. But it's also, they're so beautifully made, they're also in the ornament. Here, these used to belong to my sister. These are wow. effigy animal pipes from hard stone from the whole world culture, which is a very well developed Eastern. Uh, middle US culture. And about, they're about 200 BC to 500 CZ. And this is again a frog and a beaver, you know, both associated with water. Next, please. Okay, this is what I have been. I used to be an ethologist. And one of the last papers I published was of this. Terrific, unique pupfish that lived in this El Policy, Mexico spring until they pumped it dry. And what was unique was that here, this tiny species was paired with a large species, which was the most aggressive of the pupfishes that I've studied, studied. And they coexisted in the same spot, but then People wanted to go bass fishing, so they started throwing bass, and they started pumping, and lo and behold, by 2013, when I published the last paper, they were gone. People all over the world tried to save them, but there was one male in Germany and a female here, and you couldn't get the paperwork. <laughs> so, make travel easy, people. Uh, so I was a, trained as an ethologist, but I worked as a gerontologist. I, because of being a scientist, you had to take a lot of photographs to document your work. And also when I started the Bee Journal, well, you had to supply your own photographs. So I became a photographer. 
Then I was already writing as a scientist, I still do write, but I tried to make it so more lay people could understand me. <laughs> and then yeah. if you're writing about jewelry, you need to know how to make it. So I trained myself how to make jewelry. And I'm a fairly good artist. I draw well. And then because of here's some of the jewelry I make. Uh, this is heat bent bamboo, and this is gold and uh, polyester jewelry. Here's one of my photographs that I was used for a cover. Um, because of my fascination in being born on the eve of World War II, I've always been interested in the war and uh, those that were in the war and the instruments of war. And here is a Scratch built British wow. vessel. Wow. That's one twelve fiftieth scale. So oh, I think it's only this big. As you can see my hand. Uh, next, please. So <clears throat> these are three issues that have the information about what I talked about tonight. Next, please. And we've been doing this for forty eight years between 74 and 22. And I hope that uh, I'll be able to continue for a little while longer and Patrick will carry on. Uh, and then the last slide. And these books reflect things that I am interested in. I wrote this in 1995. I wrote this book in 2013 tell people how to shoot jewelry and clothing. And this book just got published this year in England about um, scale model naval ships of World War II. So um, that's, um, that's who I am. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Um, I, I do. How is uh, Argolite made? Do you know? It's Argolite? It, it's, it's, uh, is it pipe stone? It's pipe stone. You know, the most famous pipe stone is that from Minnesota that a lot of Native American cultures use. Well, Argolite is a pretty soft, very homogeneous stone. I don't know how they mine it, but it must be pretty easy to mine. It must be pretty easy to work because of the way that you see how delicately they, they are able to make sheets of it and then make it into uh, disk beads and other things. You said it was a sandstone, right? It's uh, not so a sedimentary rock composed of some clay particles and basically mud and use that stuff. Oh, it's yeah, good. it's it's like solid a mudstone. It's like shale. Shale, yeah. yeah. yeah it's like like shale. Shale. But it's pretty and uh, it, it, it works well. It's not that friable. So it's not that. <laughs> did, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering about the bronze. Um, I mean, obviously, understanding that he was familiar the water. <laughs> But um, I mean, I've been to a lot of dry areas and there's nothing to make sure I don't see dry. It's just not because they're so busy. I was wondering um, if they used to let them work so much, why would you have to mention it? They could very well be, you know, many effigy animals had significance. It's like the area of the Egyptian. Had plenty of 12 handles uh, 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 And, you know, the use of jewelry, we're in California, and I would hear keepers all the time. Now they don't have rainbow. They don't right. have water. They can't you know, survive. That's sort of a cultural question. I noticed on the first slides they had a picture of one of the structures, and it appeared like uh, there was a uh, layer of rocks uh, on the first set, and then maybe a bunch of bricks on top. And uh, the trouble is, yes, you're acres and three acres, right? 
Yes, you know, that, 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 yeah, it is because there you saw a megalithic uh, oh. uh, below, and then you saw the Inca, and then you saw the Spanish uh, uh, architecture. Now, so, and it looked like with the rocks, it was a subculture, and then on top of that, maybe a Spanish style deal. Has there been any megalithic uh, structures or stones or anything that have been found in any of these villages, um, say from the public people or megalithic and there is no evidence that I know of where people use pre columbian walls to build upon. But in Peru, it certainly did. You know, they had these beautiful foundations, rocks heavy, and then you would put the small extruder formation on top of that. That doesn't occur. We're, we're too young for culture. You know, we're, we're maybe nine, four, five thousand years old. And we, don't, we don't have a history. We don't have big selling. Uh, many things are built of rocks, a whole wall. The Mississippi is wooden people. Wood is their building too. We also build wells, but that's not rock. But we don't, I don't think that occurs. Uh, I think we also study crew rings uh, has shown that there were probably about two periods that lasted as long as about 200 years of drought in the southwest part of the United States. So I'm sure that had a lot to do. Those 200 year crops had a lot to do. On the coast, you can see most of those places were abandoned by 1300, 1400. You know, people had to move south where they were feeding rivers. Because if you go to the parts of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and Mexico, they're terrifically arid. You know, you just barely can find water. That's why, for those of us that study problems of water and depth, we know that whatever's living there is going to be a threat because people in the body want that water. You know, water is so precious and rivers, you know, dry up. As you can see, they bleed us from. Uh, they were, but have you ever seen canals in the Phoenix area? I have. They, they were terrific monumental uh, structures to enable people to water. Uh, but if I have water, running water, was running water, the people kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I have neighbors in San Marcos. They drill wells in the gardens next to me. I think that our precious stone water is going to be used after long. And we're in a crisis. You know, we may be limited to 10,000 gallons or whatever we need to buy. And here people are watering yards and not watering them less. You see, right off everywhere. So, you know, without water, you can't. Yeah. The, if I can see, sort of, you look at the area, the Bongo Flats and the Salted Sea, uh, and there's some uh, uh, indication that even in the 16 or 1700s, the Gulf of California came all the way oh, yeah. up almost to the well, you know, you know. And could could this area here have been have far more water no. during that time where the, the, the western part of the, the, the states, the southwest part, had a lot of water? I, I don't think so, but the Great Basin, which is the area that we're sort of studying, 
That used to, they used to be 600 feet of water. 600 feet of water. And the reason why the puppies that I studied are now dotted all over the place, these are remnant populations where the water went down, and the only thing that saved them were maybe springs that kept them alive. So there was much more water, and you know, and, and not way back, there was a Catholic sea that covered a whole lot of Europe and the Mediterranean. So just like that, we had great lakes that were 600 feet deep. That's all gone. So invest in water. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you Thank you so much. Thank you.